So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Schlich. I hope I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Um, so Peter got uh, his uh, uh, did his uh, uh, mat uh, studied mathematics uh, with a minor in uh, computer science uh, in Göttingen, and then received his doctorate in mathematics from the University of Leipzig. After two years uh, research stay at the PFL in Lausanne, he joined the Volkswagen uh, Group Research in uh, 2016 as an AI architect. There he leads, uh, he deals with the research questions on AI technologies for automatic driving. Uh, so his, his uh, main research interests include distributed machine learning for auto autonomous driving and methods for monitoring, explaining and roboticizing deep neural networks as well as securing them. Uh, he's also a member of the platform learning system group, uh, Mobilite un intelligent Fakas system. Um, and he's also the project manager uh, for um, uh, AI technologies for autonomous uh, driving. Uh, so, um, so thank you, Peter, for um, giving this uh, uh, invited talk. And uh, I will now, go on to um to allowing him to you know present his talk uh, all right can you guys see me uh yes okay so let me just quickly uh share a screen so um you should be sharing you should be seeing something now yes uh, there we go yes it's just a Title slide. So, uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks first of all to you know for this for those kind words and for the opening of the workshop. It's always a bit of a of a you know pressure situation to give a first talk in a workshop. So uh, I hope you know I give it a good start. Um, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. As as you introduced my, my already myself already. I'm just quickly going to jump over this. Uh, that's pretty much what you just said. Um, and just say uh, what what I'm going to talk about. So. Um, as, as as you said, uh, my my background lies with autonomous driving and with uh, the uh, you know the, the automotive industry. So I'm shortly going to uh, just just tell everyone you know what autonomous driving actually is and also why this is uh, maybe an interesting um, uh, challenge uh, from from the aspect of, of machine learning uh, and and you know more importantly of course you know from the respect uh, with respect of of uh, distributed learning. And then I'm just going to quickly go into into some sort of uh, general overview of, of what the challenges are that we that we need to face. In particular, of course, with respect to uh, the application of, of deep learning uh, for for perception systems. Uh, and then I'll just um, you know dive into distributed learning and try to then basically open the stage for those experts to come afterwards. All right. So um, talking autonomous driving. Um, so it, I, you know, one of the most important things to, to know um, about autonomous driving is that we haven't yet seen any autonomous driving out there on the roads. So, um, so there's, there's, there's what they call levels of autonomy. So it starts from, from a zeroth level all the way to a fifth level, wherein you know, a level five autonomous car would be a truly autonomous car that uh, you know, is completely automated in a way that you know, it starts from a, from, a, from a start, it goes to a destination and it has, you know, makes every decision in between by itself it doesn't need any interaction with with any uh you know human human being let it be over remote control or you know within the car and uh the whole liability responsibility you know all, all safety aspects lie with this with this computer system on the other hand there is a zero level which would be completely manual driving that's something we saw i don't know some 50 years ago and you know on this on this path to, to reaching this this you know goal of of you know having having vehicles drive by themselves we we've we've made a few you know steps already even some some you know 30 40 years back when when cruise control was uh, was introduced into cars so as soon as the car starts driving you know taking over some tasks of the of the driving by itself then we, we talk about assisted driving uh you know longitudinal control such as uh, cruise control or adaptive cruise control were the first things there. We also see um, assistance for lateral control. That's that's called a lane assist sometimes. So that's that's when the car takes takes over the steering in order to, to stay, say, in the middle of a, of a road lane uh, and, you know, make you not uh, leave the road or going to the oncoming traffic. Uh, as soon as we combine those two things, um, having lateral and longitudinal control uh, in an assisted fashion, then we talk about a level two car. So such a car can in principle drive alone 
and adapted speed um, to follow to follow a lane, for example, or to follow a highway. And sometimes you can even, uh, by by doing some interaction, like you know, clicking the blinker, uh, you can make the car sh uh, change lanes automatically. That's that's something we do see quite often. For example, uh, you know, Tesla is selling this as the autopilot function, uh, and that's uh, just a that that's a standard level two function. It's very important to know that this is not automated driving at all. This is still just assisted driving. The important feature here is that we always ask the person, the driver, to be to be in place and to be ready to take over the um, the, the driving task, even without being prompted. So, so it's it's the responsibility of the driver to watch over the safety of the overall system as it is being assisted by the computer. But whenever something happens, the liability and the responsibility for whatever comes out of this lies with the driver. Now moving to level three, this is specifically the paradigm that would change. So in a level three system, we would basically see similar uh, levels of automation. So the car can say follow a highway by itself, or maybe it can go uh, a, a dedicated road in, you know, in a city by itself, uh, but the responsibility lies with the system. And whenever the system you know, gets out of bounds, it doesn't, uh, doesn't know how to control the vehicle anymore in a safe manner, then it has to you know, it has to prompt the driver, it has to hand over the task, and only after that point, the driver would be in responsibility again. So here for some limited time and, and a limited number of tasks, the car, the vehicle, the system is responsible and liable for the, for the activity. And, and that's a function that, that no one's ever sold. So that's, that's, that's the point where, you know, the whole industry, including players like Google or Zoox, um, are, you know, are, are facing. And um, you know, a level four then the system would be a system which is basically doing the same, but in a in a broader context. So, for example, you would have a car that say um, can 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 take over the commuting task from home to to work, or it, it has a particular area. Maybe you can you can drive to Berlin with this, um, but you cannot drive to through Moscow. Uh, you know, there's there would there would be like things like this. There would be a level four system. So such a car would still have a steering wheel, so that in in those other situations you can drive yourself. Um, but it will take over large amounts of the, of the driving task. In a level five car, it's then a completely new concept where there's not even a steering wheel in it because it just does everything by itself. Uh, an important thing to know, uh, you know, on top of this, and then I'll uh, promise to, to, you know, go a bit deeper in technology, is um, that you can try to try to follow this little graph you see here, you know, starting from a level zero over level one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so that's called the, the evolutionary path, wherein you always try to improve your function until you know that you can take over, you can give over responsibility to uh, to the system, uh, you know, in in a broader and broader context, and hence you leave, you know, you reach level five hopefully at the end of a, of a long road. The other alternative would be just uh, forgetting everything we've done so far and really building something new from the scratch, really building building a a level five system. So that would be, you know, you start by four wheels, then you put something on top, you know, a lot of computers and sensors. You don't need to think about uh, you know how to how to monitor the driver, how to hand over the task, and how to detect whether or not you uh, you are in in your operational domain. But of course, it means that you have to build something which is safe by definition, so to say. That's 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 an approach that, for example, Google chooses with with a Waymo approach. That they really try to solve the automate the autonomy task right away. Uh, you know, having a clear scope to really get rid of the driver in in, in, in that situation. So that's you know, and 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 those are different. This is business cases, different uh, use cases you want to apply your car for or the vehicle concept for. Um, whereas the, you know, the level, you know, this other path is the more kind of, um, how to say, the more traditional way, right? That, that's, that's cars that still look like cars having a steering wheel and pedals and, you know, just a bit more computers. All right. Okay. So what is, what is the, uh, what does an autonomous driving system look like? So it usually, uh, it, most 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 technical approaches uh, follow a, a three-step paradigm, wherein you say, the first thing is, is, you know, a vehicle driving system has to do is it has to sense, okay, so it has to perceive the um, its surroundings, it has to you know have a map and localize itself there, so that you know after after this step, the um, the system doesn't know doesn't only know where it is and where it is moving, but it also knows. Uh, it's 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 roundabout. It's surroundings. Right? It knows you know which objects are there, which cars they have, where they are going, what's their intent, and um, and it can bring those two worlds together. There's a static world, you no, know, that is always there, and there's a dynamic world, which is you know, the objects that that move therein. Uh, and and having a combined understanding of this, that's what's the what the sensing is doing. It uses a lot of sensors for this. Um, next thing you you know have to do after you um, 
you, you sense everything around you is you need to understand what's going on there and you need to plan it, the, your own, your own path they're in. So, so here, um, so here, what, 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 is, what comes next is, is called, sometimes called the scene understanding or the planning of, of the other objects. So you need to understand where in the close future there will be free space for your car and where they won't be and what the other objects are doing. And if I, if I do something, how this affects the behavior of the other objects in the scene. And lastly, there's the acting step wherein you actually, you know, choose a trajectory. So, a, you know, point, uh, point cloud in time. Uh, that you want to follow up, follow on, and uh, and send this to your controller that is actually following this trajectory. So that's the sense plan act paradigm, and in principle, that's that's what everyone is doing when it comes to automated life. Um, and all this has to be done, of course, you know, with with some constraints. So uh, something you have to do is you have to be quick. So you have to be in near real time because um, you know if you go at a particular speed, uh, then the the delay that you can afford in order to you know not overlook a pedestrian. Uh, so that then afterwards you can still do some some halting or you know passing off of this object, uh, you know is, is is very small in particular if the speeds are big. So one usually talks about 20 hertz. So having having to go through this whole chain, you know, 20 times a second, um, and you know it's taking a 20th of a second, of course, uh, and it has to be you know done as I said already on multi sensors. And of course, in order to be to be safe and to be fail safe by means of uh, you know electric uh, failures. Uh, you have to like you know plan all this in a, in a somehow redundant fashion so that um, even if something uh, some some component like a computer or some connection cable uh, fails to operate perfectly, uh, you're still you you can still you know act in a resilient fashion. All right, so why is why why is this why is this a, a, a tough thing? Um, so one one thing is that's important to know is that you cannot stop whatever you do with autonomous driving. You know, with a with a normal standard mobile app or with a, you know say a Siri functionality in your in your iPhone, you know the the worst you know that can happen is that it just breaks down. Okay, then it just stops functioning and everything is cool because you know probably you know nothing serious will go on. But if you do this on you know say on a hundred k you know driving on a hundred highway, uh, just just stopping the functionality won't do, right? Because you're still, you know, two tons of mass traveling at 100K straight. Uh, you probably want to do something about this. Uh, second thing, you know, which you can see in this in this picture on the right-hand side, of course, it is, uh, it's a complex task. There's, there's many subtasks. There's, a, there's an enormous space of possible inputs and scenarios and situations and objects, which are currently, you know, and, and changing all the time. So it's, it's unclear how to, how to model and understand this world. There's many subtasks as I just laid out on the, on the slide before, uh, and in terms of uh, you know looking at at machine learning and its and its safety aspects, of course the data that you need for this is is hard to get. Uh, that's that's very important to know. When when people say that you know machine learning got its big hype from the fact that there's you know two main drivers, a hardware and b data, then this is only true for for classic CE tasks, right? I mean where where people are uploading a lot of images and tag them by themselves. And so saying you know uploading a photo and saying here you know, this is me and my dog. And everyone is doing this, so you can take all this data with the labels that that people you know handily added to the data uh, and and train your networks. So, so that that's that's what gave this huge hype to to machine learning. But now when you think about autonomous driving, where there's a lot of sensors like lidars and radars and cameras and GPS and map and all those things, uh, then then this data is, is much harder to get because a it is it's extremely big in volume and it has to be you know of, of high uh, of high density. Um, and B, it is data which is extremely strongly dependent on, on, on the actual system. So the, uh, the positioning of all those sensors with respect to each other, because then, of course, all of a sudden, the, the, the coordinate systems, the relative coordinate systems, change as soon as you change the, uh, the positioning of the sensors. So, so this whole task has to be retrained as soon as something changes. And that means uh, the data is, is hard to get. And of course, also hard to label, because you know, who, who, would, you know, take, who would call it an easy task to label all the pedestrians in the scene? Uh, and say, you know, which which is road, and, and why why can I all all of a sudden, you know, drive on those rails, whereas on other rails I can't? And there's there's like many many labeling challenges here. Okay, now going into a bit more, you know, specific challenges for uh, for machine learning. Um, let me just um, you know quickly dive on those eight topics that you see here. Okay, one one first thing is 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 um. It's something which is which is uh, you know explain which is doubted a lot and is also uh, discussed a lot. That's this whole area of dependable or explainable AI. Um, so here, uh, you know what what's what's often said, and I, and I think this is also true to a large extent, is that we do need um, the systems to act plausibly to be able to tell why they do things. 
because that's the only way that you can reach trust into autonomous systems. If, if, they, if they convey the feeling of, of behaving chaotically, uh, then, then it's going to be very hard to build up trust and to, to you know, you know, put your child into such a car and let it you know, go off. Um, so that's, that's, a, uh, that's, that's an important feature, and I think, to get, and also to, of course, get some, some official certification for the safety. Then there's an aspect called neurohacking sometimes, or adversarial um, non-robustness in robustness. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's an intriguing feature that in particular computer division uh, systems have that, you know, by, by adding small little perturbations, and this could be physical perturbations like signs or stickers, or could also be digital um, signal perturbations such as, you know, noise on, on, on the input signal, uh, you can actually dramatically change the output of a network. And, and that happens to every image-based vision task, no matter it's, you know, taking several time steps into uh, into consideration whether it's looking with all on, at all sorts of hardening techniques it's just a challenge that is there and it's a challenge both for for safety as well as for security issues and it's something we need to deal with um, and which will we'll not find a you know a complete answer so it's just take something to to always take into consideration by by means of you know for example uh, supporting other sensors next to to uh, video in your in your system uh, then I've quickly talked on this there's the need for labeling so I'm just going to jump over this for the sake of saving time. Uh, and then there's this aspect of resilience. I, I quickly talked about this on, a, on an EE side already by saying that we have to have redundant systems on a hardware level. But in fact, we also need to do this on, on, the, on, the, uh, on a software level because we all know that um, you know, detectors, for example, they, they tend to overlook things every now and then. And, and you know, striving for reaching the perfect detector is probably uh, too hard, you know, too, too big of a goal. So it's, it's, it's rather important to find out about you know how what, what can you do in order to detect misdetections and to deal with with those with this uncertainty that we have in us in, in in our system uh you know in order to to be able to to deal with situations wherein our machine learning algorithms aren't perfectly inferior in the situation uh that that's uh, you know um it's a very important feature because even if you were to have a perfect classifier you would still have the theoretical situation that that like something completely new, you know, pops up. There's, there's, you know, people from Mars that all of a sudden land on on the street, and and you know, there's there, there's also going to be objective uh, uncertainty in a situation, even if our our perception systems are working perfectly well. Uh, then there's the hardware challenges, which is not only about the fact that we need to squeeze large computers into small machines, but we also need to infer them quickly. We have to be able to to run neural networks in a at a very high speed in a repeatable and um, uh, and you know, uh, consistent fashion, uh, which means you know, timing has to be the same. Uh, you know, inference has to be uh, you know, dependable, uh, and and also we have to be energy efficient because the thing is that um, those computers and those sensors drain a lot of energy out of the batteries, and as soon as we, uh, you know, switch the system on, we see that the mileage goes down. So you know, having some having some efficiency in terms of energy uh, consumption for those hardware uh, concepts is also extremely important. And then there's additional things like you know you need to cool those machines. Those machines will be will be you know uh, experiencing a lot of physical load by just you know them them being shaken, them you know being heated, and there's dust and things. So there's a lot of hardware challenges uh, to to also come around. Um, and you know we need to be uh, real real time and redundant. I guess I I already talked a bit on this. And then you know once all this is done, once all those challenges are are settled, you know we have robust networks, we have all the data, we uh, we you know have found resilience measures and the highway uh, that the hardware stuff is, is solved and it's all done redundantly. We need to verify the system. We need to find a, an argument uh, which plausibilizes in a in a you know understandable and certifiable way that the system is safe. And we have to come up with concepts that that actually do this not only once, uh, which is which is you know hard enough as we all know that you know, neural networks are kind of black boxes, but we have to do this in a continual fashion because the world around ourselves, sorry, the, the world around ourselves will be changing and there will be new concepts coming up and there will be new behaviors as soon as there's autonomous cars. And, and all of a sudden we have to deal with a world that is currently changing and we have to adapt the safety uh, argument, uh, you know, all the time, you know, in, in accordance to this. Now, let me just give you some, some you know, colorful examples to, uh, to also, you know, magically have a have a smile appear on your faces so here's you know there's there's a, there's a concept of, of 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 labeling classes right but those labeling classes are, are shifting you know you know this this thing you know back in the old days would have been you know small kits so you could plausibilize those objects to be small 
and you would know that they be they they're slow but unpredictable. Nowadays, it's actually adults driving on those things with 20 kilometers an hour in a predictable fashion. Yes, but much quicker and uh, and hence for much more um, uh, much more relevant to to also long term plan them. Um, so that's one thing. Then there's a thing that, um, according to context, of course, the way that you interpret what you see is different, right? If you go to, you know, if you, if you travel, if you travel Cologne in the carnival times or, or Rio de Janeiro in the carnival times, then all of a sudden bananas might not be objects you want to run over. Um, so having, having done an inference correctly does not mean you perfectly well know how to deal with the situation. Um, of course, we need to define new classes, right? There's, there's, there's objects. There's, there's people in the world inventing new things, and you know, segways were some of those, were some of those uh, objects, which are now all of a sudden, you know, in between pedestrians and wheelchair drivers and bicycles and maybe you know, mofa, you know, motorcycles. So, what is a segway like? If I have to label a segway, which, which of the class do I label it to? And if I label it to one class, doesn't it confuse the network so that all of a sudden it can't distinguish a pedestrian from a, from a bicyclist anymore? So those are challenges you you need to see, and then of course there's there's also funny things, right? There's uh, landscape drawn to cars, and there's, there's like, like many aspects of this. There's bridges that that are that are being held up to you know for for ships to cross. Um, so there's also many obscure situations where again you correctly classify and understand what you see, but that's not what it actually is. So the man, you know the, the semantic dimension is just uh, you know adding trouble here. Okay, now let's just um, Let's just jump on distributed learning. Um, hope I'm not being too quick. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, okay, now talking about distributed learning in, in, in all this setup, what, what can we actually do, you know, bearing all those challenges in mind? So um, something you, you would very much like to do is apply federated learning, not only in the sense of you know, what it initially was, was invented for, which is just splitting the tasks of, of learning onto, onto different computers, uh, that that would draw their data from from the same source, but ideally you would of course try to get rid of this whole data collection, data uploading, data cleaning, data labeling, uh, you know, tool chain, which is which is eating up a lot of energy and time uh, by means of just you know deploying neural networks in, in in a fleet and have have the cars actually train as they go around because they see all the data and they see all those special situation and you can imagine that you you have all those you know fancy detectors in your car that that find you know special situations and then you train a network and then all of a sudden of course what you will be seeing as, as you do in federated learning those networks will, will you know start to to uh, to, to uh, diverge and then you just you know at some point in time the backend will tell you that they need to to uh, you know re-aggregate those models uh, you know centralize the models aggregate them you know find a, a better next increment and redistribute this into the fleet so this would be you know a very a very cool little little thing to 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 see and um, you know, life would be much much better. Uh, but you know, bear in mind that I talked about a lot of uh, um, challenges before. So so you know, what's what's the, what's the challenges to to this little little ideal um, world? Well, first of all, um, we uh, we do interact with an open world now. All of a sudden, right? We don't we haven't centralized data, so we can't cure the data set in a way that our machine learning algorithm is is being the data presented in a fashion which is uh, which is ideal for learning. And you know, an ideal for learning usually means that you have some sort of stochasticism in the way that you choose data. So the data is, is coming with a with a large variance. So you don't you don't you know, your, your your network is not pushed towards one direction first. But not all of a sudden that you 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 distribute the learning job into the into the MOOC, um, you know vehicles moving, they will be moving alongside the habits that they usually have. So if if I I don't know if you deploy this to to a regular commuter, then this, this neural network all of a sudden will only see the path from home to job and back at the same daytime, so all the time. Seeing the same other vehicles, only seeing the same traffic signs, uh, you know, the same nature. So it'll, it, it, it can actually start learning this task by heart because it's just very easy. It's just, a, you know, like a, a small stretch of road it sees. Uh, and it's it was also seeing this alongside the same, um, uh, you know, background of decision that the driver is doing if there's a driver in place. So it would even, you would even be biased towards those decisions that the, the driver makes as soon as there's, or as long as there's the one driver in place. So this means, this is to say that the feature distribution tends to be very imbalanced. It tends to be very local. Um, and by, by using, you know, localized vehicles for a learning job, this is something you fall into uh, and you have to, you have to uh, 
uh, deal with. And there's of course this this idea of concept drifts. If you if you start learning over time with a large fleet, then you know it's summer and then it's you know it starts being autumn. So all of a sudden trees will not have leaves anymore. Then there's snow in the game. So so you you, you have this this constant drift, which is which is that you know let's say at at mid speed in terms of you know as the time goes by, and that's something you also need to take into account. And I mean this this uh, you know four seasons aspect is just just one of them, right? So there's there's very many aspects that you you see. I, I don't know how the traffic changed now that we have you know this whole COVID thing in place. So probably something is different now than it was a year ago in terms of traffic. And and if we do federated learning um, with, with, with the vehicles out there in the world, then they would actually see this thing, which is a positive thing on one hand, because they can kind of monitor. On the other hand, it's it's something which is much less controlled since it's just happening out there in, in, in this huge fleet. Uh, of course, there's a, as I said already, there's a potential for behavioral biases. And, um, you know, we... we do not know the whole world, right? Because we probably, you know, have the fleet constraints in some in some regions. So that's that's also a bit of a of a challenge. And then, of course, we need to uh, describe the the what's called the operational domain. That's a standard term in in safety. So that's basically the uh, the domain of definition for for a system. You know, that's that's where the system has to be safe and, and functioning well. And that's something, of course, we need to detect. We need to find out whether we're out of this domain, because then we don't want to learn, because that's that's you know not what we need to learn. Okay, when it comes to the certification and the safety argument, then of course we do need to, uh, whatever comes out of this, we need to say, uh, certify, uh, sorry, certify this. We need to be able to plausibilize the safety of whatever comes out here, but we don't have the data because the data was just, uh, you know, processed as we, as we went through this, and, uh, through this whole thing. So we need to somehow provide evidence for the reliability and the safety of the systems. Plus we need to find evidence that the training job we've done didn't harm the networks. So we need to have a, a sufficient test coverage on top of the training coverage, uh, which which is uh, you know reproducible in a, in a way, or which is at least uh, you know tractable by by some means. Um, and of course, we need to understand the um, uh, the exposure that that our systems uh, you know receives from uh, from potential dangerous potentially dangerous situations. So there might be sit I mean, there might be things which which are potentially harmful for our system such as the Bristol examples, uh, but we need to understand how, how likely are they? Well, you know, what's, what is the actual residual risk that comes from, from, those, from those things? And that's, that's something we might or might not be able to, to learn from federated learning, but it, it's a challenge to keep in mind when, when thinking about federated learning and such aspects. Um, and of course, you know, we want to reduce the unknown unknowns. So by, by means of having the fleet flock around, flock around around the whole world, of course, we want to make this fleet detect situations or or circumstances or combinations of influential factors that that we, we didn't think of before. So that's that's also you know a, a, a chance or a challenge, you know, however you want to put this for uh, for federated learning. And then of course there's this thing that you know if you want to do fancy bancy deep learning training in, in a car, then this comes with a lot of uh, you know challenge to the to the hardware that you have there because all of a sudden, you know, the compute, the the energy that you need, the storage that you need, all this is, uh, you know, is is, is put to a, to a different limit, right? To a, to a different, you know, that's a new dimension of load that you have. Everyone knows that inference is much uh, easier to do than than training. Um, yes, and of course, oh yeah, sorry, that's there's there's <laughs> there's the biggest challenge I didn't even mention. The biggest challenge is, is what you see on the right hand side here. There's no labels. Right. If you if you there's no there's no label in the loop. I mean, unless you you want to have someone that sits in the car and actually is doing a pixel labeling for a semantic segmentation task, there's only a limited number of tasks you can actually do in a federated learning by means of the car just you know, taking data from the sensors and actually immediately learning um, uh, a task. So you have to do uh, some sort of semi-supervised techniques or even unsupervised techniques. You need to be able to maybe withdraw the uh, the labels that you actually need for a task from the from the system being being operational so there's there's uh, you know there's also this challenge uh, which is which is you know big but let me just uh, talk about a couple of things that um, we did um, you know on this in order to see whether whether that's a cool technology and and I you know just to, to a bit of a uh, do a disclaimer here it is a cool technology to, to choose. So something we did uh, as a as a kind of a first um, you know proof of concept in the you know in the old, in the early days was just taking um, taking what's called the end-to-end -end driving approach that, or sometimes called deep driving. So here you infer things like the steering angle or the uh, the gas pedal position just from uh, from the from what the system sees. So you don't actually do the sense plan act paradigm in an explicit fashion. It's just implicitly done 
uh, by a neural network. And you know, that's, that's a task you can quite easily learn because the feedback is immediately there, right? As soon as you crash into something, then that's, that's negative impact. Or as soon as there is, the, say, a deviation between what you, you know, proposed your system would be doing and what the actual driver did, Again, you see, you see, you know, you see deficiency that that can, you know, can be transposed into into a loss. So labels are something you can you can get there. Uh, we use the car simulator here as as, as a data source, and uh, you know, started off with some um, periodic averaging and compared this to dynamic averaging, to a you know, say a bit more fancy protocol uh, in order to uh, to cope with the fact that there's there might be local imbalances, so that the divergence of the models can can happen sooner or 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 later if, if you know the data is quite homogeneous that those agents see. Uh, and what we you know reached at is we reached at you know an extreme um, saving of of communication when comparing um, periodic averaging with dynamic averaging, and we we saw that uh, the the precision and and the high accuracies reach much quicker uh, from you know by means of periodic averaging over uh, dynamic averaging and comparing this to local learners, this is always a bit of a tough challenge, because uh, it's you know it's an it's an unfair comparison. Right, having a, having all the data at hand is, is of course better than you know having only limited data per learner, but we, it is it is competitive to say the least. And there's a couple of publications on this. Um, you can just check out afterwards if this is of of interest for you. Um, something else we did was uh, moving away from uh, from the idea of of actually learning. Uh, in the car, you know, in order to cope with this with this hardware challenge, something you can do is you can um, measure uh, easier things in a federated fashion. So something you can do, for example, is you can just learn the quality of particular sub features of your network. You can learn whether or not a particular filter is being used a lot or is being influential for the decisions when driving around in, in the car. So here you wouldn't be learning a task that is inherent to the autonomous driving system, but you would rather learn a, a meta information about your system in order to later on uh, you know, process your, um, uh, your system in a, in, a, in, a, in a coherent form. So here what we did is we, we uh, calculated or learned in a way the, the brittleness of, of particular filters over time in order to to reach a better adversarial robustness whereby compressing the network in the, in the same time uh, and it actually works quite well so you can you can actually much easier than in a lab environment you can find out which of the filters are more or less influential for you know on, on average in an expect uh, when it comes to expectation in uh, in, in real time uh, real world exposure uh, and then just prune your network accordingly reaching you know, more robust networks uh, in terms of adversarial robustness, in particular to small uh, statistical um, perturbations. Uh, and uh, of, of course, you know, since you do pruning, you, you also compress your network and enhance, accelerate the, um, the inference, uh, saving energy in the end. Uh, okay, a third one um, is again, something which, which involves uh, training um, in, in the cars. So here we, um, we you know try to we try to answer this question of, of of labeling in a in a bit of a more fancy way by means of what's called a surrogate model. So here we uh, basically uh, deployed two models into into vehicles. Uh, one is a you know a, a huge large scale network that is that is uh, you know an expert. It actually knows uh, quite perfectly well how the uh, how the world is, is is being seen and is perceived. But it might be a network that is just not you know possible to deploy into a standard car. And you know, alongside this, we we just deployed a, a much more compact version, like like mobile net or similar network topologies, um, and and have the the small network being trained by the large network in a student teacher fashion uh, on the data that the uh, the uh, the vehicle sees. And here you can even um, make use of this this the localized imbalances of the data. So you can think about local models being trained out of this you know huge network so it, it kind of concentrates its knowledge on uh, you know some 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 local uh, area in into a smaller network and what we saw here is that um this is of course oh, okay, a very very important thing this is this is very nicely combinable with central approaches so you can just use this as an as an intermediate step maybe even as a, as a pre-training step or uh you know uh as just one one building block in the overall development chain and then in the end uh uh, you know, reach, uh, and that's actually something we could we could uh, uh, we could uh, find out is that we can you can reach competitive performance in the network uh, by uh, by using a lot smaller networks. So the networks would be dramatically smaller, hence inferior, much easier, uh, and being being deployable into into edge devices in a in a much uh, likelier form. Let's say, um, 
by uh, you know by by uh, by reaching the same performance on a more limited uh, domain, so to say. So if you do, if you restrict the domain and you use a a, a teacher as a, some sort of noisy label, uh, then then this is this is you know of, of big help here. And uh, I guess. Um, I need to look at the time. Only have three more minutes, so let's 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 be this the last slide, um, a bit of a of a of, a, of an advertising slide. So something we uh, we uh, together with our friends from the Fraunhofer Institute we um, we did um, prepare and construct a a framework to run all those experiments in, which is uh, which is trying to encapsulate all those aspects that I mentioned earlier uh, that you would have as as challenges when when interacting with a fleet, but it could also be interacting, say, with mobile devices, for example. Um, uh, that's that's a it's a it's a framework which is available from from GitHub, um, and it is um, uh, it is uh, simulating different learners and its communication shape in between, uh, and it, it's deployable towards towards all sorts of servers. Uh, being agnostic to the actual machine learning tasks, so we can, uh, you know, use use Keras uh, models as well as PyTorch or TensorFlow models in there. Uh, it is uh, flexible in the way that the central entity communicates with all those learners. So that's that's of course an important thing because different communication forms come with different pros and cons, like like timing, for example, or the volume that you want to send to the different learners. Um, and of course, you know what's what's important for for this for this automotive and also for other mobile use cases is the fact that um, not every learner sees the same amount of data in every time gap, right? I mean, the, the, the car might just be broken or might, might, be, might be sending around the garage or you know, the driver might be sick and just stay home for a couple of days. And, and the same goes for, say, mobile phones and, and you know, when, you, when you want to develop apps, uh, that you know, the, the usage that you do with your system, the interaction you have with the system is, uh, is not constant over time, uh, which is you know, a standing assumption that we see very often uh, in, in distributed learning approaches. Um, Yes, and uh, something else we, we implemented into this framework is that uh, that we can we can actually support different distributed learning schemes such as uh, you know federated learning as as proposed by Google or dynamic averaging which uh, we came up with in you know our first project, and of course um, something which is which I didn't talk about a lot is uh, that you know a major stepping in all sorts of distributed learning tasks is the way that you combine the models once you know, once you fitted them uh, individually, and you can think about just uh, you know averaging by doing the mean of those models, but in principle, you could also try to be smarter by doing weighted means, for example, or by doing, uh, I don't know, radon points, or like there's, there's so many different points, you know, geometric means, arithmetic means uh, I talked about, uh, but, but, you know, basically every very center that you choose to the set of all those, um, to all those, those models is, is, is you know, is a, is a candidate uh, next um, Model and uh, yeah, basically this this framework is open to to just uh, you know integrating all those different um, methods of aggregation. Yes, and this is specifically and right to the point ending my call. I guess I, I, if I remember correctly, it was 9:45, right, uh, Central European time. So so then I guess uh, you know thanks for the audience.